Welcome to Twin Peaks Radio, the show where we remember in the words of Major Garland Briggs, a real mystery can't be solved, not completely. It's always just out of reach, like a light around the corner. You might catch a glimpse of what it reveals, feel its warmth, but you can't know the heart of it, not really. That's what gives it value. It can't be cracked. It's bigger than you and me, bigger than everything we know. I'm Professor Robert E.G. Black, and today I'm finally going to be getting past the opening titles and talking about the pilot. First of all, strange episode here, I got a guest, my co-host from Two Minutes About Time, Luke Allen. Hello. Hello. So you have watched, what was the other David Lynch thing you just watched oh, recently? Hang on, what was it called? The short film with the monkey. Oh, uh, Jack. Something. What did Jack do? What did Jack do? Yeah, it was in film class. And David Lynch stuff had been like something that I knew I needed to delve into at some point. Yeah. Elephant Man is one which I've owned for years and not watched. I don't know. I feel like that's probably like one of the least Lynchian Lynch films. It, it is. It's one of the more normal that and straight story are his like mainstream films. If Elephant Man is the reason he was able to make a bunch of the movies in the 80s that he did, though. I've, I've had Lynchian given to me almost as a criticism that some of my films have a shot that feels Lynchian so doesn't fit the rest of the film. So that's my knowledge of Lynch was the odd moment where someone's been like, that seems Lynchian, but the rest doesn't. <laughs> Do you know what they mean when they call it Lynchian? Sort of, but I don't know how to describe it. It feels artsiness is a vague term, obviously. Yeah. But it, it feels a little more like the surrealism of the visual storytelling can kind of overcome the narrative yeah. for the sake of aesthetic pleasure, per se. Which the aired version of this pilot, you don't get much of that. No, I was a bit disappointed for the start. <laughs> I was like, oh, am I just watching an episode of Dawson's Creek? Like, that's what it felt. It felt very 90s. The pilot was edited to be released as a film internationally. That does not surprise me. And so basically they tagged on like a 10, maybe 15 minute thing at the end which basically uses clips from like the third episode oh okay and shoves that into the end and treats it as literal more than dreamlike because that's part of what this becomes is there's dream involvement and it gets more supernatural and stuff if you take the international pilot as it is it's more literal it's like here's the killer and that's not what it is i won't spoil it for you though just in case you haven't looked it up. No, I haven't. As to what or who the killer actually is. No, it, it felt unsatisfying and simultaneously like I'd experienced a full story. Like, it was quite weird. Because I wasn't sure what they were doing. I didn't know from a pilot perspective, having hmm. just heard of Twin Peaks, as to whether it was going to be like an anthology thing or whether it was supposed to be a, a serial thing. And <laughs> from the end, I still wasn't sure. Well, it's the serial thing. Essentially, it was, you have soap operas. Yeah. Yours are different than ours, I think. But essentially, it was a nighttime soap opera built around a murder mystery. Okay. Like the structure of it. But also, both Mark Frost and David Lynch kind of wanted to satirize and play on those tropes of nighttime soap operas. Your soap operas still have seasons, though, right? Yes, nighttime ones do. I feel like, at least as it works here, I could be corrected. That our soap operas kind of just run indefinitely, like three times a week. Well, our daytime ones do that. Okay. And they'll run, they used to run five days a week. Now I think they less than that because they get smaller audiences than they used to. To delve a little more into it slightly from what I said, it reminded me a lot. I made the joke of Dawson's Creek, like just that kind of feel of 90s small town story that is, is the sort of vibe I got which I quite liked, but it surprised me how, considering the reputation of the show, it surprised me how soap opera, as you said, it felt. Because I knew that it had kind of a big following. And when I first watched it, first maybe 10, 20 minutes, I was kind of like, I don't know what separates this from other shows. Yeah, the beginning, other than the opening titles, maybe the mood it sets, it could be any other show. It could be cop shows from the 80s and they're setting up this town the things i compared it to just a couple episodes ago were murder she wrote which probably never seen but maybe you've heard of yeah and picket fences which even less you would have seen or heard of because that wasn't as popular 
Murder, She Wrote apparently ran for more years than I even remember. Yeah, I see it on reruns. A lot. I've never watched it, but it seems always on the TV guide as like a rerun thing. You were saying before we got going about trying to keep all the characters straight. Yeah. I am not sure how many of the main characters are introduced in this episode, but I know on Donahue, the whole episode is on YouTube in pieces. Mark Frost pointed out when someone asked that there were 35, I think he said key or f- what word did he use? Uh, what is the total number of featured characters in the in the series? 35. Very well. That's why I have trouble <laughs> yeah. keeping up with it. Yeah. <laughs> yes. 35 major characters in the show, which is a lot. Yeah. Even for a soap opera. And it only ran for, what, 30 episodes? Yeah, it ran for two seasons. And then came back in 2017 for season three, but that's a different beast. That's more Lynchian in a way, because right from the start, that show's weird. So I guess my first question is, at this point in time, who was Lynch? Like, what what was he known as and for? Well, he was, he didn't win any Oscars, I don't think, for Elephant Man, but I believe he was nominated and he did win some awards for it. And that was like mainstream success. He went on from that and did, I only learned this recently, he was asked by George Lucas to make Return of the Jedi, to direct it. Oh. But he didn't want to. He didn't want to do some mainstream science fiction fantasy thing. And so he turned it down. But then the impression I got from the other thing I read about it is his agent pointed out how much money he just passed up. (laughs) So then Dino De Laurentiis comes to him and offers him Dune and he takes it. So then he made Dune, which not that many people saw. It did horribly at the box office and critics hated it. Jumping in from editing because I looked it up to double check with a estimated budget of 40 million. Dune was actually, its opening weekend, number two behind Beverly Hills Cop. Beverly Hills Cop took in $11 million. It was in its second weekend, and Dune made $6 million. Then the next weekend, Dune remained number two, Beverly Hills Cop taking in $15 million, and Dune taking four point seven. And then in its third week, Dune dropped to eighth place, taking in $4 million, but it would overall only gross about $30 million, so under its budget. So it definitely took a loss, but not necessarily horrible. I don't know about all of the critics. I just always got the impression it wasn't well liked. I looked up my sort of go-to standard for critics. Robert J. Ebert gave it one star. And his review begins, It's like a dream, my friend from Hollywood was explaining. It doesn't make any sense, and the special effects are straight from the dime store. But if you give up trying to understand it and just sit back and let it wash around you in your mind, it's not bad. Uh, Which, of course, is incredibly relevant now because every supermarket chain is selling the Lynchian doom, I think, under the hope that some grandparents at Christmas are going to pick it up. And (laughs) I was planning to rewatch it before I watched the new one, and then I just hadn't gotten to it because it's one of the longer movies on my watch list right now. It's not anything that... I think I will watch it, but it's nothing that had ever like tickled my fancy. But how big this new one is has surprised me. If you want to understand more of the weirdness of Lynch, at this point it would have been Blue Velvet. Blue Velvet's been on my list for a long time. Which quite famously opens with like the camera dropping down into the grass and the mud and like crawling around where you can see bugs and like It's basically about this dirtiness in suburbia. And then the plot hinges on like this guy found an ear in the grass, like a severed ear. And it sets a whole thing into motion of like this. It's sort of like a criminal Mm. plot, but with weird elements. That explains a lot more why Lynch was brought up a lot in my film class recently. Mm. So we just wrapped on our unit on French surrealism. Okay. And we were talking about influences. And had you ever seen In Chan on the Loop? I don't think so. No. Okay. So it's, uh, I think it's Louis Bonoel is the director's name. Okay. He did In Chan on the Loop, and the year later he did Large Door. In Chan on the Loop is about 15 minutes. And it was basically a response to the middle class artistic audiences that were trying to find meaning and everything. And mm. he decided. Basically, it was him and Salvador Dali, I think, worked on it with him. Oh, cool. And it was like they they came up with this idea. And any time that two scenes felt like they could have connected to one another, it was like, no, we've got to write another scene. Because I don't want there to be any logic from how we get from A to B. Shortly afterwards with Lajdor, I don't like it as much because, first of all, surrealism for 
an hour and a bit is a little like that that level of surrealism is too much mm, yeah. and that one was more targeted at offending the church so it was for those who know me i was not particularly happy or expecting a film from 1930 to end with jesus walking out of an orgy of underage girls that he then murders that wasn't on my expectation. No, you wouldn't expect that. So that film I, I like a lot less than uh, <laughs> Shan Andalou. And it's one of the few times I think I've been actually like offended by a film. So mm. that's it, it did what it wanted to do. Yeah, it feels like that's what they were going for. <laughs> and that was the annoying thing was like, I wanted to say something in my class, but I didn't want to give the filmmaker credit for what he tried to do because <laughs> I didn't like it. So it was like, do I say that I'm offended or not? And then it came up like a week or so later with some of the people on my table and they were like, were you offended by that? And I was like, yeah, <laughs> quite a bit. Yeah. But in Chandelou, I think, from what I know of Lynch, from what the few bits I've seen, is something that I think you should definitely check out. Yeah. It's just nonsense, but aesthetically pleasing nonsense, I think. I think I never made an effort to watch... I saw a couple of his features. I've never watched any of his short things. Even Lynch, I hadn't really watched. He has a bunch of weird short films that are on YouTube now on his channel. And I've watched a few of those. They're interesting, but when they're short animated things, they don't need a point. Yeah. They just got to like draw you through in and keep you. I've That's seen, it. I think we watched the first half of the first rabbit in class mm. and i've seen your remake my lego one yeah i've seen that because i think you plugged it on two minutes of that time at one point and so i saw your version first <laughs> <laughs> and, and it was kind of like well i guess the original one will make sense no <laughs> and then, then i watched that in class and our teacher turned it off about halfway through and she was like and you get the idea and it was like yeah that's i get you <laughs> I remember when i was making that lego version i got the scripts for the th- was it two and a half versions of rabbits there's actually two there's actually four i think total Oof. and like put them next to each other because i'm like maybe they make sense if you combine them <laughs> like you take a sitcom script and then just cut out every other line and this is what you get but now there are lines in it that clearly go together and it's it's oh whose version of poetry was that from like the 50s or 60s the cut up method you take any bit of text like you write a page of text then rip your page into like quarters, rearrange those quarters and read it. I did this on Annihilation when I did the writing on the walls because I did multiple versions of that wall writing. And that was one of my methods is that I took it, printed it out, cut it into pieces and rearranged the pieces randomly. Because then it's like, if it's poetry, it should still kind of give you a feeling, especially when it's poetry that you're not quite clear of the meaning. Yeah. Same with a short film or with editing, you could do the same thing. And I know that actually... When I said that it was mostly used as a criticism against some of my stuff, that bits felt lynching and bits didn't. Mm. So I know some people, upon reading the script of Regista Clear, yeah. said that it felt lynching. Were you one of them? <laughs> I can't remember. I, I don't think I would have used that term. Some, someone mentioned David Lynch, and I, that was the first time that I'd, I think I'd properly heard it related to surrealism. I knew it related to artsiness. I'd never kind of known how surreal he got. I think the main one I remember is in my coursework film, which once again, you've seen. Yeah. Piotr Skopiak, in his feedback, said that the, the one shot at the start, when the guy leaves prison and he waves at his dad and his dad's like in the distance in the car park. Yeah. He said, that doesn't make narrative sense. It looks Lynchian, but he was like, the rest of your film doesn't suit it. He was like, there's no reason mm. for him to be that far away. Which did make, which, <laughs> which was like a, a good point. And yeah, I, I definitely in the edit was thinking, why have we got him walking this much? So little things like that, where I was like, oh, so Lynchian is good, but can be bad. <laughs> and that was kind of. Oh, even in Lynch, it can be bad. I mean, I'm doing a show about Twin Peaks, but there are parts of Lynch and the way he makes things that I don't like. I'm not a big fan, actually, of surrealism as a film thing. I like when it has a reason. His has an explanation overall that works with Twin Peaks. Because essentially, if you treat the entire show like it's a dreamlike thing, like dream logic, any weirdness can kind of work. Okay. And you can you can take it as this. The pilot, you get none of that no. going. So it's like, it's more grounded. Which is weird for a pilot, surely. You want to set the tone. Yeah. It's actually strange in that way. I think it's deliberate, though. 
I think that was probably not even Lynch's doing. It was probably more Mark Frost. He had worked on television. I was going to ask whether it was like a network thing. I, I've got to do some reading on, on Lynch and whether he talks about Bunuel at all, because Bunuel dream logic was a big, big thing. He definitely referenced French things before. Part of The Return is filmed in France, and he did an art show in France. I know. So maybe. But yeah, this pilot, I think, was almost a deliberate choice of leave out some of the weirdness so that you drag people in because the pilot was on Sunday night Mm. and it was like a nine o'clock Sunday night, get a big audience. And then like the first episode is Thursday. I was 13, 14. I was like, so into it. Murder mystery, weird characters behaving weird. Like you get over the top acting that Lynch likes in this pilot with like the people wailing when they're sad and stuff like that. Yeah. But this pilot is more just murder mystery, what happened. And so it's like, oh, I need to know. And all of these people are doing these bad things. I want to know what's going on in this town. And so you tune in the next thing. And I think you get your first sort of supernatural part. You get a little bit at the very end of this when the mother sees it's the necklace being pulled out of the dirt. You get that slight hint of some sort of supernatural thing because she sees that. So when you were talking about the kind of dream logic and sort of the bit in the performance, I definitely felt like there was almost the comedy photographer. Oh, Andy, yeah. Which I didn't quite get because the tone wasn't, oh, we're wacky and silly, but it felt like they were trying to get us to laugh with the idea that he was constantly shocked and upset by everything he saw. Yeah. It was very kind of overacted and I didn't quite know what the show was going for. It felt like a B movie or like a really trashy movie, but the rest of it didn't. Totally. Yeah. No, that's a good description. Essentially you need to think of Lynch's stuff is it's almost like all the films he ever watched were made in the fifties and oh. some in the sixties. I, I get that tone actually. Yeah. And so uh, this show especially is basically a small town that is still living in the fifties. The way Audrey dresses is straight out of the fifties America. Everything is really innocent. They all love the homecoming queen and she's this ideal person, but the show is immediately telling you, no, she was doing drugs. She was having sex with multiple people in one night and something else she was doing led to her murder. And it's, it's letting you know, there's all these other weird deals Mm. going on under the surface of this nice fifties town, which is a common Lynch theme. Then you add to that the like, doppelgangers and people with the same names and add supernatural elements and you get into his 90s stuff with twin peaks or at least with the pilot who would you say the protagonist is because it feels kind of omniscient it's actually strange because the show's protagonist is dale cooper but we don't meet him until like halfway into the episode. Yeah, because I, I expected that we'd be, which to be fair, I found really interesting for a sort of crime thing to be bouncing through the different people affected by it. It felt quite, mm-hmm. we spent way longer with the parents mourning the death than I think you usually have. And yeah. that really intrigued me mm-hmm. because it made me realize how much is missed out in your standard crime movie. Yes. So that defi- I, I definitely like. I'm, I'm not recommending you try to watch this and you actually shouldn't if you haven't watched Twin Peaks, but there's a guy on YouTube, uh, his count is Twin Perfect. He did a four and a half hour long, really well-made video. Like the editing is great. He uses clips and nice sound bites and stuff nicely. Did a lot of research, basically explaining Twin Peaks, four and a half hour video. His actual premise, I really dislike. And he sets it up so that every argument he makes is just supporting that premise and he never goes off on any tangents. And so the more you watch the video, the more annoying it gets. Essentially, a big part of his premise is that the show is doing what crime dramas weren't doing. Is It's always the victim is there for one episode. They're a dead body. They're a prop. We're now following the cops as they investigate. They solve it. Next episode. And this was no leading into that crime, dealing with grief, dealing with all of the aftermath of how it affects. I mean, there's people, you could guess this, but there's people in this episode that had nothing to do at all Mm. with Laura's death or the bad things in her life, but they're all affected in some way still because they're connected to people who are connected to her. And so even though we only have a small part of this town represented by the cast, they're all affected in some way by this murder and what went around it. And that's sort of the purpose, yeah. Which I think is what I really love, is that like I adore character-driven stuff. Like just being about the people and the... I mean, you say that there's, what, like 30 like lead main characters, but 
at the end of the day, it still feels small scale. And that's what I really like. Mm -hmm. It's like, I'm not a big fan of kind of big action scale, action stuff or big like sci-fi things. I would love a melodrama any day. And Mm -hmm. even if this is more crime drama than melodrama, it has that kind of character driven, like my scripts that I write, I've been told a lot of very dialogue heavy, but that's what I enjoy watching. People have taken that as a criticism, but also it's not like my characters are blatantly always saying what they think and what moves the plot along. They're just talking because people talk. And I know some audiences get bored of that, but those aren't the audiences I want. So for me, the stuff that I write, and I think it's fair to say there's a TV pilot I'm associate producer on at the moment. To get picked up for series, you know. I'll have a plug the crowdfund at the, <laughs> the socials uh, at, at the end. The gist I get from the showrunner is that that's what we're going for is a very character and dialogue driven thing because that's like I, I've heard some people say they don't want to watch something where it's just people stood or sat about talking, but honestly, that's what I really, really like. And I, I've probably lost more people <laughs> willing to donate than in, in saying that. I don't know, but. I could see why people calling some of your things Lynchian, but not fitting the rest of your story would be a thing then, because though he does like dialogue, he also likes yeah. long lingering takes of nothing. Mm. And he likes long pauses in his dialogue, which some people can't get away with. They want to edit around that and make things go faster. He doesn't, he's not in a hurry. There's, there's something like that, which I'd want to risk, but I'm not established enough to show that it's a deliberate decision. Mm. And I think that's that's almost what intrigued me with what Twin Peaks was doing as a pilot, was in having that kind of, like what I was saying about the, the, the almost comedy character of the, of the photographer and stuff like that, where it's like, it's clearly Mickey taking, but if you had no, like if I was watching that and I had no understanding that there was a whole series and a whole cult following and thus something worth grabbing onto, I might have just taken that as bad writing or bad acting and decided not to watch. Mm. So there's a level of bravery, but also I think Lynch had to be someone who was trusted in order for us to go, oh, he's doing that for a reason. Yeah, basically coming into this, Lynch was an established filmmaker who was very like cult audience. And then Mark Frost had been working on established TV shows. I mean, he worked on Hill Street Blues, which was a big cop show in the 80s. It lasted for years. And a few other shows. And then they come into this working together. Yeah, they, there's a built in idea that they can be trusted. Like, whatever they do in the pilot, something is going to work for us later. And like Andy, the deputy who's taking the pictures, and Lucy, the secretary, are sort of comic relief a lot of the time. But we need that because the show gets so dark thematically. Like, you need comic relief. And they're setting it up early that also this comic relief has feelings and will cry at the sight of this dead body who is someone that everyone knows. I think it works, especially in a pilot that you're establishing. We do have different characters and they're going to have different reactions. It's not everyone's trying Mm. to solve this and everyone is affected the same way. I mean, Audrey is a troublemaker in this episode when she puts a pencil in the coffee cup and then just pulls it out to spill the liquid everywhere. And when one of my favorite scenes, speaking of like Lynchy and like that pausing thing is, when she goes into the meeting room where the Norwegians are talking and she just kind of lingers over by the wall and waits for them to notice her. Excuse me, is there something wrong, young pretty girl? I found my friend Laura. Lying face down on a rocky beach, completely naked. She'd been murdered. (laughs) 
She sighs loudly, but she waits. Like she's such an interesting character immediately for me because she's stuck on making trouble and we don't know why. Yeah. And he's got the patience to let her do it. It's weird because I I came out of watching the pilot and uh, about five minutes from the end, my mum had just come back in from work and she knew I was watching it for the show. And she was like, you know, is it something you want to you want to get into watching afterwards? And I felt really, really indifferent after the pilot. I was like, I'm not going to go on Amazon Mm. and order the box set. But if I saw it in a thrift store or something like that, then I would pick it up. And that was kind of what I'm feeling. But even upon just like the first five, 10 minutes of our conversation about it, I'm like, I really want to see where this goes. Yeah. Um, I don't normally do plugs because this isn't that kind of show. So before I get to the end, you are a podcaster or have been. You are a filmmaker. So what do you want to plug? Yeah. So the the one thing that I want to plug today was what I mentioned before, since we're talking about a pilot, Mm -hmm. is if you get onto Indiegogo, and either if, if you're in the position to donate, this would be obviously greatly appreciated. But if you're just in the position to share it around on social media, it'd be great. Indiegogo.com forward slash campaigns forward slash care home TV pilot. We're producing a 90 minute pilot of a drama. I would say comedy drama, but I think the official thing is drama with hints of comedy that is set within a care home. But not like necessarily like an old people's home. It's sort of like a supported living situation. So there's different people of different ages, different backgrounds. The, the conversations I've had with the showrunner Gareth, the ideas that he has for a, a, a five season arc, which is obviously very ambitious when mm. you're at a pilot point. Yeah. The story points he's laying in this pilot that no one's going to have any idea are going to be a massive thing if we get to season four or five. There is so much potential in this show. And I feel I can say that because as associate producer, I'm not writing it. There is, there is so, so much potential for this that I think we are saying that if we can't get it greenlit, we will try our best to like self-produce because we just love what this has become. Hmm. But honestly, it is fantastic. The talent that is being drawn into this show is amazing. And so if we can get the chance to show that, it would be great. And I believe the goal is about £2,000 to produce it, which for a 90-minute special is literally just location accommodation transport sort of thing right that's my plug nothing of my stuff to plug at the moment now listeners remember in the words of major girl and briggs mystery is the most essential ingredient of life mystery creates wonder which leads to curiosity which in turn provides the ground for our desire to understand who and what we truly are this has been a production of lemming drop studio you can find links to more at lemmingdrops.com Follow the show on Twitter at Peaks Radio and on Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok at Twin Peaks Radio, or join the Facebook group Lemming Drops Studio Tour. Also, you can support all my shows at patreon.com slash lemmingdrops, where you will also get access to every episode of this show, as well as the occasional review of good movies and bad movies. Join, fund, whatever. If you got money for Indiegogo, money for Patreon, we love you, both of us. Yeah. Choose who you support. Yeah. <laughs> The owls may not be what they seem, but they still serve an imperative function. They remind us to look into the darkness.